Don't listen to the guys that want to brag about their top revenue. It's the bottom revenue that is everything. I treat our employees the same way I'd want to be treated, and they have to treat the customers the same way we'd all want to be treated. Your family's the most important, so if you've got games and stuff, you've got events, leave early, go to those things, make that happen. But when there isn't, stay here and do what you got to do. Hey, how's it going? It's Tim Brown, and this is the Plumbing and HVAC Hustle Podcast. And today I have Leland Smith of Service Champions on. How are you doing, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you, sir. And we're talking about scaling businesses and what you can do to scale. And we're going to focus on the one to $10 million businesses because I think a lot of these guys need the education the most yes. at the beginning. But uh, what are some numbers that people can look at of things you've been part of? Well, right now, I'm with the Odyssey Investment Group, an awesome group um, that's brought us to unbelievable levels where we're, we're probably close to over 700 million right now. Uh, we have 20 locations, and we are by far the most profitable of all the equity groups out there. I think as a total group, we're running about 17 to 18% profit. And I know that 17 of those groups are well over 20%. We've got a couple that are struggling, but. Uh, it's just a great group, the Odyssey group. We got one of the best operating teams that are out there, and they really know what to do. They work their butts off on a day to day, and they really prove it. When you got your competitors are running 13%, and we're running 17 and 18, that just tells you a little bit what's going on. I like that we're talking about that 700, 800 number, and you move it right to profit. That's yeah. a sign of a very mature business. Well, don't listen to the guys that want to brag about their top revenue, it's the bottom revenue that is everything. My uncle Odie told me once, it ain't what you get, it's what you keep. Mm. And you've got to keep that money and that's what people will buy you from. So even if you're a 10 or $20 million company, what's your bottom line? What, what do you make out of it that people would want? You guys, do you have Hobayaka Home Services as part of Service Champions? I think, yes, we do. They're in Arizona. Arizona. I went and toured their shop recently Yep. And I also got to hang out with a, a fairly new technician and I followed him around all day and I got to be up on roofs and, you know, he did an amazing job and they have such a great training system right. in that company. I think that's a good testament to of well, the types of companies that you've partnered with. I'll talk about my company. I sold it in 19 to my first equity group and I sold it in 18 months to another equity group, uh, Odyssey. But, uh, they probably got it. One of the things that I did after five years in business, we, I learned from Jim Abrams that be the most expensive, pay your people better than anybody else, because if you're most expensive, you can do that. But the quality of work you do has to be above reproach. You don't cut corners. You don't not put a line set in. You don't change the plan. All that you have to do, everything. And in our case, we have a happy money promise that if you're not happy, we can't make you happy. We're not gonna make you pay for it. So we always are making our customers happy. And that's a real critical thing when it gets to it. The quality of work's gotta be there. You gotta make the money and, and you gotta make your, your employees happy. And really we have a family culture that I treat our employees the same way I'd wanna be treated. And they have to treat the customers the same way we'd all wanna be treated. And one of the things that we always do, if a customer calls in and is complaining, all we ask them to do is the agent or the tech, if they've got a problem, how would you want your mother or your father being treated if they were the ones calling and complaining? And we tell them, I don't care what it is, if it's family thought and you would treat your family this way, mm. do that for our customers. Don't have to ask a manager, just do it. And if we disagree with it, we think it was a bad decision, you'll never get in trouble. We'll teach you how to do a better one, but just focus on treat that customer like family and you will grow and you'll have so many customers just keep on coming back. I've heard it said by sales coaches, get your mother out of the van. Yeah, there you Do you go. disagree? The, the, idea is, the, the idea with that is, and it's kind of controversial, but the idea of it is we're not sure if you should be, that, that idea is like, we're not sure if you should be selling with your mother in mind because maybe yeah. people want to buy stuff yeah. sometimes when you wouldn't because, right. you know, people are in different stages of life. Yeah. Do you disagree? Yeah, well, I, I think you're right. But the key thing that we teach them is you've got to offer it when you're there. Mm. And we teach them 
First of all, when we hire people, it's about personality. 85% is they have to have a great personality that when you walk into that home, and they got to have the appearance. We don't like beards. We don't like a lot of tattoos. We want to cover it. But your personality when you walk in, and you think about how would your mother react to this guy walking in? Mm. How would your wife? I've got a gorgeous two daughters, and I think if this guy we're hiring would walk into one of them by themselves in the house, how would they react? Mm. So we train that way. And the key thing is you got to offer. Offering is the most important. So if you go out and you're selling an air conditioning system, you don't have to tell them, but you need to look for the water heater. You need to look at the ducks. We get up, take pictures of the ducks. Actually, we got a video, if you look on YouTube, about typing service champions about 15 down. There's a YouTube that shows you exactly how we design our ducks. And they tell, the text tell us, it blows customers away and we sell more ducks that way. But you got to offer insulation as well. So you don't ask them to offer it. You offer it and show them what it is and see if they want it and let them tell you no. But they're never going to come up and tell you, can I get new ducts? Can I get new insulation? Can I get a new water heater? <laughs> mm -hmm. They don't know, but you're the expert. You go take the pictures, you explain it to them. And we first time we offered water heaters, we sold 47 water heaters in a month, all because we asked for it. So that's a key thing. And back to your mother thing is, it's family. How would you want your mom treated? How would she, what would she be thinking? But you gotta also be looking at the quality of their home. How can you improve the efficiency? How you can stop repairs so when in the middle of the summer, the system goes out, they're two weeks waiting for somebody to come out. So we kind of encourage them to replace the system before that happens. So we're selling systems in the spring and the winter when everybody out here is, we're slow, the weather's not there. We're not a weather-driven company. We're totally a maintenance company that when weather is there, it's better. But that's how we make money every single month. We're very productive. Our guys have three calls every single day all throughout the year. And that's because we're focused on club memberships. I don't know if we want to talk too much about that, but we had 25,000 club members when I sold in 19, which was 50,000 tune-ups that we didn't have to pay for. And 65% of our revenues at that final year in 19 came from club memberships. Whew. So I always tell our guys that I'd rather you sell a $19 club, $19 club member than a $40,000 job. Because if you can get a customer on the $19 club membership and stay with us, we will always get that $40,000 job. If you can't sell a tune-up, you're not going to get the revenue. You're not going to get the big tickets. Hmm. I like that. Okay, so if we're going, let's, I'm thinking about these $3 million to $5 million guys, trying to get to 15. It's a different problem, but you went through that at one right. point. My so, key, yeah, what would be the key to scaling? I've said this over and over again. I'm not that smart of a guy. But I had a friend named Kevin Comerford, and he and I, his father helped me a lot, and when he started, I helped him, and we were just a good team. And we would always negotiate together. So what we found was, when we come to events like we're here today with Tommy Mello or different groups that focus on HVAC, we would search out, if we were five million, we wanted to find the 10, 15, and $20 million companies that were doing good. And we found them at the break, we got them at lunch, we found them, try to get them out to dinner. And then in a month or so, we want to go visit their location. Because mm. we surrounded our people that were smarter mm. than we were. We, if we were five, we didn't need the three guy. We wanted five, we wanted the $10 million guy to show us how to get there, or what challenges he had, what problems he had. So we, and we called it the family. We would get, try to get five at a time, so if he were five, it was 10, 20, 30, maybe 40. And then we would meet every Tuesday and talk for an hour at 10 o'clock. Every third Tuesday, we would share financials. And if the company would not want to share their financials, we didn't believe they were making money, so we wouldn't want a part of it. But when Kevin and I hit the 20 or 30 mark, we got out of, out of that group and got in a new group. If we were 30, it's a 50, 60, and 80. So when I sold in 19, uh, Kevin and I had a group that we called the family. We were the little ones at 50 million, but we had 80, 90, 100, and 120 million dollar companies that we would meet with and talk with. And we were friends, we got along with they would share, but things that we were doing, they didn't know and they learned. Hmm. A lot of stuff they were doing, we didn't know and we learned, but we wanted to get people smarter than we are, by far smarter, greater, greater profit, so we knew what to do, because they'll tell us what problems they had growing from 20 to 30, 
and we could skip that. We know the problem mm -hmm. and, we do, and you can get that quicker. So it's really surround yourself with people that are smarter than you are. Sometimes people are a little, you know, they weren't direct competitors probably. Right. Yeah, none of these guys were competitors. Okay. We would never do it in our market. Yeah. These guys in the last one, they were Kansas, Texas, South Carolina, everywhere but here. Mm, okay. Everywhere but in our market. Awesome. And I, I've heard that you didn't miss soccer games with your yeah. kids. And so I was kind of curious, you know, you've got this age old stereotype of a thriving business owner, entrepreneur that's stressed out and kind of moving fast, maybe yeah. even excited, but maybe not there for those types of things. So how did you do that? Quite well. Um, my son is six foot seven, it was basketball, and he was on a traveling team from seventh grade all the way through college. I never missed a game, mm. unless I was at a place like this out, away from it, but it were at work, or I'd even go to Vegas where they'd have a tournament for three or four days and I would go and be there. And they'd have me basketball games at eight in the morning and 11 at night, which was crazy, but I'd always be there. And my son noticed that. One Father's Day, my wife asked the kids, tell me something about your father. And Austin said, my dad never missed a basketball game. But when I wasn't doing that, I was at the office. I was always working with the people there so they can do the same thing that I did. I wanted them to know how big family is and how work value is and not to overwork, but work smart when you do work. So I shared that with them as much as I can. Your family's the most important. So if you got games and stuff, you got events, leave early, go to those things, make that happen. But when there isn't, stay here and do what you gotta do. But I always encourage that to happen because it means a great deal to your kids. So Rilla allows you to listen to, uh, it's, in your, it's an AI in your pocket, yeah. listens to the appointment. It's pretty crazy what they do. It gives a script, gives everything they said, it breaks down some statistics for you. Analyze talk ratio, interactivity, like how you and I are interacting back and forth, uh, long as yeah, model, like, like all honestly, those things. this is the shit that I most believe in in the AI. Yeah. You know what I mean? Enhancing You're about to put math yeah. and data around something that used to be my magic skill. What is overwork? I will say, from my point of view, sometimes I feel like an underdog or somebody that has to work harder to get yeah. the same result as some other people. What, is, what would you say, because you, you're probably a natural high performer. I don't know if I'm that, but I know I love work and I'm a six to seven day of work guy. And I was there Monday through Friday. I'd get there first in the morning. I went to every training. They always saw me there always motivating them, always talking about how great they're doing. And I'd come in on Saturday and get a few things that I didn't get done that week. Then I'd come in on Sunday for maybe three or four hours and I would look. And they called me the looker because I would look for things but I didn't know what I was looking for until I found it. And then you start finding things that are going on. And just to give you a, a quick example, we had a big trailer in the back and um, I saw a bill come in that said that uh, it was 10000 a month to have this trailer to, to move the trash out, which has got to be moved out. But then I looked and found out the dump site was 1.2 miles away from us. <laughs> so Monday I came in, I got one of the guys in the warehouse, I said, put it all in a stake bed, drive it up to the 1.2 miles, dump it, come back, tell me how long you took it and what it cost you. It took him 30 minutes and cost him $20 <laughs> to move everything that day. So that was like $600 a month we would pay. We were being built 10,000. Hmm. So I went to the warehouse manager the next day and I said, get rid of this green thing. We're not paying 120,000 a year for it. And he said, you know, we're, we're pretty busy. I don't think we have time to do that. Well, unfortunately, uh, I moved our warehouse manager to a different position. <laughs> uh, we got rid of the dump site and we saved $110,000 just on one thing. And just to give you an example of another one, our, we, we trained all the time. A lot of people don't train. Training is critical that you're training. We trained every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. All the techs, all the installers were in for some form of training. But what I saw, they were clocking in at 6.20, 6.30 for a seven o'clock meeting. And you have 300 techs coming in and they're all clocking in 30 minutes ahead of time. That's 50, 150 hours you're paying more every day times five times 52 
because literally hundreds of thousands of dollars we were paying for time that they weren't working. So we changed it and they couldn't clock in until 6.55. And we saved, again, hundreds of thousands, all because I was looking. And I find that managers generally aren't going to be looking for something that's going to make them work harder. They're going to let it go. Mm. And somebody's got to be looking or you got to motivate your managers to find those things. And like you probably talk about, like no one's going to be as motivated as you, as the owner, the one who's really looking at that bottom line. Yeah, I do. I mean, I, I, I'm a numbers person. I understand the numbers. But I would also talk to our employees and I tell them, I don't make a dime unless you make a dollar. My life is about you making that dollar because when my employees made money, that's how I <clears> made money. If they're not making any money, I'm not making anything. So I'm always focused on how can I get them to be better at what they do, how they can make more, how they can take care of their family, how they can buy houses, how they can buy rental houses and make a lot of money. And I was very successful in getting them to do that. But hmm. somebody's got to be there to let them know this is what you, we want you to do. But you got to do it right. You got to be perfect with the customer. You got to do quality work. And that justifies charging a higher price, like a Mercedes or Bentleys or whatever, as opposed to a Hyundai. The cheap guys will always look for how to cut the corners, not to put a line side in, not to put planos, not to do all that, where we did everything 100%. And we backed it up with the happy money promise. Hmm. What advice do you have for young entrepreneurs who may feel a little bit discouraged by the current economy? Um, I'll give you an example that I went through in 2008 when the economy was supposed to be shaky. And I had friends in the family, the group that we, the companies, was Horizon Services, and Dave Geiger and Mark Aiken were there. And we had a meeting, and Mark Aiken, the marketing part of Horizon, said, we're not playing this game. We're not playing this, what they're saying in the economy. We're going to get better, we're going to market more, and we're going to take more of our competitors' customers. We did not go back that year. Hmm. We went up, we still grew, we still did good, because our headset, my mindset was, we're not playing this game. Hmm. We're going to get better at it. Because you listen to the media and they talk about how bad things are, then people stop marketing, they mm -hmm. stop hiring, they stop doing things. We did just the opposite. Hmm. Yeah, it reminds me, maybe, maybe this is from you guys or something, but Rick Picard, he's a $12 million mm -hmm. uh, comfort advisor, he says, uh, I refuse to participate in a bad economy. Perfect. You walk in with the right attitude. It's, it's kind you, of easier said than done sometimes, mm -hmm. I will well, say. You, you've got to have smart people to know that. and You've got to use your financing. We find companies that have financing over 70% of their jobs are the bigger, more profitable ones. Ones that don't use the financing have smaller average tickets, and they're not making it. So, do you guys have like goals around how much your jobs are finance? We want seventy percent of them. Really? Yeah. Seventy. Seventy percent. We okay. we find that throughout the companies, the twenty that we have, those who weren't using financing had very low average tickets. Those who were using financing had very high. Like in our case, our ticket was like 22,000 was an average ticket. But we had our guys do several things. They offered the system they were there for, but they also would offer ducts, insulation, and water heaters. Customer didn't ask for it, but they would put it on the bid and say, this is what I found in the attic. This is what I found in the insulation. This is what I found with your water heater. And they let the customer tell you no. If you don't offer it, they're not gonna ask you for ducts and insulation and water heater. And that's why our average tickets are so high because when they know they have an issue with that, they're gonna say yes to it. At least the water heaters is an example. One in four would say yes. Dave Geiger gave us this idea from Horizon. One in four, we sold 47 water heaters the first month. And it was at probably twice the price that most people do, but we did a great job on it. But we didn't market for it. All we did was ask mm. and they would say yes. Incredible. Still a lot of money chasing the uh, chasing these these transactions. You know, uh, there's still really good outcomes out there for sellers. It's good to have someone like us in your corner because we're not emotional. But guess what? When you're selling your business, it becomes it becomes emotional, and so it's really good to have an, an intermediary. You know, there every step of the way. www.sfpadvisors.com. All the contact information is directly on the uh, on the website. How do you feel about, or traditionally, have you felt <clears throat> about, I'm gonna try this again. <clears throat> They've been talking a lot. Yeah. 
It didn't help that we were talking during Jaw Rule last <laughs> night. I was like yeah. trying to like have discuss business discussions with people while Jaw Rule is very loud. Yeah. So people are starting their own businesses as an entrepreneur, you know, it's a little discouraged. I've had people do it as like when I was, I was early and it's kind of a little discouraging. Right. How do you think about that? And I'm sure it's a little <laughs> easier as you grow and you like, you see some people go out on their own, but obviously it's still tough. I've seen more failures than I have success as they struggle. I'll give you an example. I had one of our employees, a $3 million producer, decided to go start his own company. A month later, he calls me and says, Leland, how do you make the phone ring? I'm thinking, you're missing a lot because he's a sales guy. Mm. But when, when these guys do it, they never know what we're doing in the office, what the accounting is doing, the marketing, everything that we're doing that got that call to ring, to somebody to answer it, somebody to dispatch it and get it to him so, to sell three million. That's all he knew. I got a call and I sold three million and I made money. He never knew all that when the money went back in, what did we do with it, had to pay the bills, workers comp, all the shopping, I mean, all that people just don't grasp. And even the same guy called me last week, said, how come when I talk to my employees that are not doing a good job, they're all quitting? And I said, it might be the way you're talking to them. Mm -hmm. Find out what it is, because I'm a believer that if somebody fires me, I mean, somebody quits, they fire me. Mm -hmm. And I take it personal, and I always try to get them to sit with me and try to explain to me, why are you leaving? What did I do wrong that you would fire me? Mm. And I learned some stuff, you know, I'll, I'll find out stuff that I didn't know was in, in the field that people were unhappy about. And I would always talk to them and I'd always let them know they could come back. Mm. And half of them would probably come back, they go to another company, and I feel like our company was so different, so unique, so focused on the family, so focused on the, on the techs, making as much money as possible. And they walk into another company and they're broke and they're cheap and they can't pay you and they don't have work. Where we had 25,000 club members, so our guys had three calls every single day the entire year. They, we'd never send anybody home early. And they don't see that when they leave and they'll try to come back. Some will take back, but we always want them all to know to come back. But I really wanted to know why they fired me so I can fix a problem that I probably didn't know. Mm. Okay, this one might take a second to think about, but I like to, get some questions answered. You know, if people often want to talk to people that are successful and they say, can I pick your brain? Mm -hmm. So there's like a, what kind of mm -hmm. questions that people often ask? If there's any like common threads of what people consistently ask you when they try to pick your brain, and I want to answer those for you so that maybe you don't have to have as many of those conversations by having this video get out there. Right. You know, I've talked to a lot of people yesterday and this morning as well. Most of them, it's just a variety of things that they're not understanding, uh, you know, how to pay, how, how to grow. Because, um, again, most of these guys are techs and they have never been on the backside. And um, when I started Service Champions, I was the only one in the office. So I was doing accounting, I was doing IC, I was doing dispatch, I was doing call center. So I always told our people, no matter what size we got, I know exactly how to do what your job is. Mm. I can't do it as good as you are, but I know how to do it because I did it for years. And um, that's what they really miss. So I, I can't say any specific thing that's over. It's just a little bit of everything. Talk to me about the pay structure type stuff, if I you don't some mind. Of those, yeah. And um, I would tell you the worst thing you can do for your installers is pay them by the hour. Because if they're working and they're on an eight-hour job and they know they don't have any work tomorrow, it's now a two-day job. They're going to stretch it out. And um, you've got to make sure that you're managing that. In our case, we pay task pay. We pay hourly or task pay. But if it's an eight-hour job, we would pay them 10 hours on the task pay to motivate them to do a good job because they had to do the job right. And, but I'd even tell tax if I knew an installer didn't have a job tomorrow, you're out quoting a job. If you have to, give it away. I don't care if it's at cost. I'd rather not make any money and make sure that installer's family was fed the next day and he had work. Mm -hmm. So, but as I talk to these guys, it's generally kind of the same stuff. You know, they're trying to learn the office stuff. Mm -hmm. How do you manage a tech? And I, tell, I told a guy this morning, I said, he was talking about installers that were always having, 
enormous amount of callbacks. And I looked at it and said, it's your fault, or the manager. And I believe there are no bad techs, there's bad managers. Because if that tech wasn't doing a good job, the manager should have been out on the job showing him, check his jobs the next day, constantly working with that guy to get him better. The only way he would be a good manager if he would come to the owner and say, I've been working with him for the last two or three months, I've been out on the jobs, I've seen it, and he just doesn't get it. But if you're a manager that never goes out on the job sites, you never see it, but we're getting callbacks all the time, your manager's a problem because that installer probably can be fixed if he was motivated and instructed by the right manager. So you've got to look as you're on the top, even the owner, if those things are happening, you're really the problem because you're not managing your managers or checking what your managers are doing. Yeah, I find that as I grow my company, I feel a little overwhelmed when I think about all, and it's 30 people, when I think about all 30 people, but when I think about my five people that I have the most impact on that right. lead others, I, I get more motivated. Yeah. I feel excited to try to help their lives. And I've also made sure that those are people I want to be around and that yeah. are ethical and <clears throat> smart. You want, to, you want to duplicate yourself. Yeah. So you're not doing it all down to the 30, but mm -hmm. the five are doing their job. Mm -hmm. But you still want to get down to those 30 guys, talk to them, motivate them, mm -hmm. let them know how good they are. Even if one might be struggling, just walk up and say, man, I know you did a really good job on this. It's yeah, I, d I definitely chat with them a little bit, but it's usually pretty light, you know, because it's I don't have all the context all the time on those people's work. Most of their jobs I've done because I was a single owner operator, right. but like there's a few of them now that I have jobs that I didn't do. I would go ask a manager, tell me one of your techs you think you want me to call that did a really good job in what he did. Mm -hmm. So they'll tell me and I'll call the tech. I said, I noticed that you did this, and it was awesome, I'm really impressed. Mm. You should share that with them. Now, I don't know all of it, but he doesn't know that. Mm -hmm. But for me to notice him, it pumps him up. Mm. And yesterday, uh, someone was talking about, you know, guys going home to their wives and bitching to the wives. I didn't get a chance to say it, but the wives are, are your in-home sales manager. That wife has to be happy when that guy comes home. So when we have company events and the wives come, I always made it a point to meet each wife and talk to them and tell them, even if I didn't know, tell them how great your husband is doing. He's really impressed. So if you get her on your side mm. and he comes home and complains for whatever it is, she's gonna build him back up. Yeah. But if she doesn't know you or know anything, he comes home and complains, it's gonna, why don't you get another job? So you really wanna keep everybody pumped up. Encourage the manager to come back or the tech to come back talk to the manager and try to solve the problem. Because all these problems that a techs or installers have, all can be set, uh, resolved in a positive way as long as the manager is there and wants to do that and treats them with respect, not yelling at them, but just get the understanding that what you're doing is hurting the company, and it's hurting your pay. And all I want you to do is make more money. And if you fix this, you'll make more money. You might have to work a little harder on certain things, but you've got to sit there and explain to them why you're doing that. Yeah, I think, I feel like I talk to a lot of very smart, high-performing entrepreneurs that we talk about that employee who's very good, but has some attitude issues. And it's like, they, they're, the, you know, those guys. Yep. And, and I have <clears throat> some in mind that I don't want to get rid of. I like them. Yep. You don't want to lose them. I think they're like, cause some of them are, ah, cause that was me yeah. when I worked for somebody else. I had an attitude problem. And I have had that kicked out of me by experience in <laughs> like right. leading people. But how can we, let's say we don't wanna get rid of them. Cause that's sometimes the go-to is like, you gotta get rid of that high performing but bad attitude person. What are some ways to help get them on board though? Like how to get their attitude right, because they're high performers. Right. Um, high performers also have high he egos, and they think they're better than everybody else. Um, I have one in mind that I know I would never change him, but I've got to address it when he does it. We call him the gamer. Anytime we have something, he will game it in his advantage somehow. Mm. And I tell people I have a 37-page sales plan. 36 of it is this one guy. <laughs> Every time he would game, I'd write a new paragraph, new paragraph, oh, to funny. make sure. And we'd watch. He was the one that would um, go home at three, 
and not close the call out to 530 after he's been home for two hours because yeah. he didn't want to do the last call. But if you look at the GPS, he's calling in and the call is here and he's already home. It's a game. So we taught our dispatchers every time, check the GPS. If they're closing out, look up really quick, make sure they're closing out where they're supposed to be, not at a different place. But yeah, you, those high performers are ones you just got to motivate, talk to them, but you got to call them on everything that they're gaming you on. Mm -hmm. But you can be nice because if you got a, one I'm thinking about sold seven million last year. So you got it, you want that seven million, but you can't let him get away with it all. And you try to pump him up and sometimes it doesn't work, but you want him to stay, but you don't want the gaming to go. So you keep on addressing it and stop it as much as you can. Yeah. But every employee is valuable. I mean, yeah. if you spent the money to invest in them and recruit them, Spend the same time to keep them motivated. But it, it, if it doesn't work and the guy, it just goes crazy and destroys the morale of all your other people. I mean, I've, I've fired a top salesperson before. And I just walk into the sales meeting and let's say, tell everybody, guys, I have great news for you. Every one of you guys just got a raise today because all the calls this guy got, which was the best, you guys are going to get now and pump them up. Mm. Now you don't want 10 guys to leave, but you can let one leave if you've got 10 other guys to take the calls. Mm. I have a series on this show called Hot Takes and Cold Trends. And hot takes is something that you think might be lightly controversial right. or, or very controversial. Feel free. Yeah. Um, and cold trends, what's something people should, be, should stop spending money, time, energy, or effort on? So the first one, do you have any hot takes in the industry? That's what I can think of. I haven't been asked that one before. Okay. Well, you know, we're bringing a new fresh energy to this industry. That's right. And you know, con the content game here, the content game loves controversy. Right. So, you know, we're just, we're playing into that a little bit. Yeah. I try not to get into that. You know, to me, it's business. They're there to make money. They want to be happy about it. They want to get home at a certain time. Some guys want to work more, some guys want to work less. But I just focus on trying to get everybody better at what they do. Mm. And by me surrounding myself with people that are better than I am. Mm. Uh, I would, you just got to find other owners that when you're 20 million, these guys are 30 or 40, mm. they're going to teach you everything they learn from 20 to 40 so you don't have to go through it. You're gonna be facing that. Mm. So you try to get all that up front so you, you address that ahead of time and you're prepared for it when you see it. All right, how about cold trends? Anything people are wasting time, money, energy, or effort on that you've seen that you might recommend they stop doing? Um, I haven't thought about that too much, but um, the cold trends, I don't know what that would be, is not doing everything they need to do on the job. Mm. They're lazy. They don't want to get up in the attic when it's 120 degrees, mm -hmm. but you got to get up there. And uh, offering the things we talked about, just different things when you have something change. We changed it, our insulation. I'll give you an example. A um, guy named Frank worked for us, and insulation, I paid him 20% because I wanted them to get involved and offer it. And the first year, it was you had to sell 36,000 of insulation for the sales guys a month or you didn't earn your bonus. So Frank, literally, he's been with me from the beginning for 26 years, four, 24 years. And he told me, and I didn't know it, pay attention to it. He never got a bonus for one full year when we did this. He hmm. refused to, 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 just refused to do it. Hmm. Now had I caught it, I would have done something, but I had a sales manager who missed it as well. But he told me one day, he goes, you know, I got tired of losing the bonuses, so I started selling it and I sold 80,000 the first month. Hmm. And now he's selling 90 to 100,000, nearly a million of it at 20%. So he's making $200,000 more than he would have, all because in his mind, he just didn't want to sell insulation. Hmm. So sometimes you've got to push them for it to have them see it. But insulation gently, is pretty good know, margins too, right? It's about 70% margin. It's Ooh. high margin. And you can easily teach people. Actually, I did it when I was in college. My dad had an insulation company and I was the skinny guy up in the attic and, yeah, yeah. and I would make like $300 a job. So 
Why don't people get up in those attics half the time? You know, they don't like it. Like I said, when we do the class, we have an attic that's built out. We put them up there for an hour or two at 120 degrees. And out of 20, we'll lose two people that I'm not going to do this. Mm. They want a different job, but they can make so much money doing it. And that's what you got to motivate them at. But once we get through those couple, first couple of weeks, we know we've got our class and they know what they have to do out there. And then we send them out with guys, the best guys, and they see the kind of money they're making. Literally, these guys, after their second year, and they could be 21, by the time they're 23, they're making doctor's money. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're literally making 150, 160, third year maybe 200, if they're really good at what they're doing and just talking to customers. And it's just a nice thing to do that I've seen the early on guys live in bad houses, they buy a better house, buy another better house, buy rental houses, buy big bear mountain houses, beach houses, and they're just making good money. It's a good thing to do. And we don't get complaints from customers because if we do, we instantly solve the problem. All right, I got a couple last questions for you, just rapid fire. Uh, what's the longest you've, time you've ever spent in a crawl space? Me? Um, I'd say probably 45 minutes. Oh, really? You're in and out? Maybe once or twice. Okay. Now, the guys are up there much longer. They have to do an hour and a half tune-up. How about? But they're probably 30, 45 minutes to take pictures. How about attic? Have have you, do you stay up in attics I'm for a long time sometimes? Attic, a crawl space. We don't have crawl spaces out here. Everybody's oh, okay. in the attic. Gotcha. Okay. And that's where it's hot. But yeah. they, gotta, they have to take at least seven pictures of the ducks to show the customer. Gotcha. They have to take a picture of our little pipe that has insulation yeah. to show the R value. Anything that they can see that's bad that we can fix. What's the hottest attic you've ever been in? 120. 120. Glove or no glove when you're um, letting out cooling? No glove. Yeah. We wear booties. Uh, we put mats out before we walk in. Yeah. We put mats on the floor. But I'm saying when you're, when you're uh, connecting the, the oh, no glove. Yeah, refrigerant. You, you want to make sure you get it right. You could get shocked uh, a little bit. We like, to, we like to ask that question on this show. I'm always yeah. curious. Because people have opinions yep. on the glove or no glove. <laughs> yep. um, well, thank you so much for being on. Where can people check you out and your company out? Um, my company was Service Champions. Right now we're called the Champions Group. If you're looking to sell or get involved like I did, you need to call me personally and I'll get you connected to the right people. Um, we've got the best group. We're the most profitable group that's out there. Um, I'll give you my phone number. Or, you know, yeah, set. feel free. Yep. Call my phone number. It's 714-240-4349. 714-240-4349. I always tell our customers when I give it out, this is a number my kids call me on, my wife call me on. So I don't recognize your number. Text me who you are and what you're looking for, and I'll get back with you. I'm a total believer I've always been a taker early on from surrounding myself with people that are much better than I am. And Ron McCann told me one time, and he was a big influence on me in Houston, don't always be a taker, be a giver. And I, 100%, as long as we're not competing against you, I'd be a giver to help you in any way, advise you. And if you want to sell to us, I'll even help you that way as well and get you the right people. Please let him know where you heard about us, okay? Because for no other reason than I want him to realize that somebody came from this. That's right. Because I think ultimately there is some value there and community growing um, with people that follow this channel, the people that follow this show. So thank you so much for being on and um, thank you everyone for watching. Let me say just yeah. one final thing. Yeah. I think the most important thing you can get out of this is what made me as successful as I am, as wealthy as I am. I realized I wasn't the smartest. And like I said, I went out and found smarter people. And even today, I'm always looking for people that are smarter. Do that, get three or four companies together, and I guarantee you, you will grow, you'll be profitable, and hopefully you'll sell to us and you'll make millions. So find people smarter than you. Love that message. Thank you, everyone. Please like, comment, glove or no glove. No, just kidding. There you go. And subscribe. See you guys. Bye.